interested, we have more results there and the uh, story I'll tell here in more detail. I'll start with an introduction of all the necessary concepts. Uh, then I'll talk about our model and how we solve it numerically. And finally, I'll come to my results. So, mean field theories. We, why do we need mean field theories? Uh, interacting problems are usually impossible to solve exactly. So the idea of mean field theories is we uh, introduce an effective potential that, uh, uh, with which we describe the mean effect of all interactions. Um, this potential is then the uh, to, be, to be determined uh, self-consistently, so we, we uh, minimize the free energy of our many-body Hamiltonian with respect to this new uh, single particle Hamiltonian. And uh, as a consequence of, of only having this mean field, we uh, neglect fluctuations. This, uh, these mean field theories can be specifically uh, interesting in disordered systems. There, um, Self-consistency may lead to interesting effects in these mean fields, for example, non-trivial correlations. Uh, yes. So uh, what do we mean with self-consistent field ensembles of disordered Hamiltonians? We heard a lot about random matrix theory already. Um, random matrix theory allows us uh, to make analytical predictions for disordered systems. Here, for example, we have a C1 uh, uh, ma matrix. So um, H and delta are real symmetric random matrices here. And from this, we can compute a probability distribution for the eigenvalues. And we ask ourselves, what does change if we calculate H and delta self-consistently? So uh, to rephrase the question, if we start from this C1 ensemble and only take the physically relevant sub-ensemble of the self-consistent matrices, does that change uh, the predictions of random matrix theory? Uh, then I want to briefly talk about the superconductor insulator transition. It's about the competition between Anderson localization and superconductivity. There are two main mechanisms being discussed. The fermionic scenario. Here uh, we have an enhancement of Coulomb repulsion through disorder, which leads to a breaking of the Cooper pairs, followed by uh, standard Anderson localization of the electrons. Then there's the bosonic scenario, and that's the scenario I want to talk about today. Um, here, the Cooper pairs localize directly and stay intact across the transition, um, but uh, the phase stiffness vanishes and we lose global uh, phase coherence of the condensate, uh, but still have localized Cooper pairs. Uh, so the experimental status of, of uh, the superconductor insulator transition is, uh, this is well established experimentally. Here we see to the left um, some calculations, uh, so some, some experiments done on titanium nitride. We have four, um, four uh, um, uh, samples here which have a different sheet resistance. So they, they, they vary the thickness of the sheets and this leads to a different sheet resistance. And so t the f this fourth sample here is the highest resistance and we see as the temperature is lowered towards zero, the resistance goes to infinity, whereas for the other ones with the lower resistance, it goes to zero. So as at some critical disorder, uh, we destroy our superconducting state and end up in, some in a, in a uh, phase that is uh, sometimes called super insulator. Then to the right, this will be important in the light of our results also. We see here's a measurement in the superconducting state of the spectral gap. Uh, with SKM measurements, and we see that it's highly inhomogeneous. Yes, so also the superconducting phase is different than we are used from BCS. The, the model we want to look at is the disordered attractive Hubbard model. We have a hopping term, um, nearest neighbor hopping on a 2D cubic lattice. Then we have a random potential with um, disorder strength W, so this is a box distribution with, with W. And we have an on-site uh, attractive interaction. This is a good model to look at the uh, superconductor insulator transition as for W equals zero and U larger than zero. Uh, we have a superconducting S-wave ground state, while for W larger than zero and U equal to zero, we have the standard Anderson model. Uh, the corresponding mean field Hamiltonian that we want to look at looks like this. We have a pairing potential here that's responsible for uh, for, uh, for the Cooper pairing, so there 
we can either put two particles in the condensate or, get, uh, or, or extract two particles out of the condensate. And we have the hard reshift, which takes care of that particles tend, uh, uh, tend to be, uh, want to sit on the same side. So we uh, have a lower chemical potential at these sites where particles already sit. Uh, now the question is, how do we determine our potentials? This, we first want to diagonalize our Hamiltonian for a given, uh, for, for a given delta and mu tilde. Uh, and this can be done by the Bogoliubov transformation. We uh, change two Bogoliubov operators, which are a superposition of uh, electron and hole operators. So we need to determine these uh, coefficients, the particle and hole wave functions, uh, and uh, demanding that we diagonalize our Hamiltonian, we arrive at the Bogolibov degen equations. So um, here we have doubled our degrees of freedom. This is just a mathematical trick, so we can stay in uh, the first quantization picture. Uh, after diagonalization, we we'll throw away our redundant degrees of freedom again. And now uh, we, we know the equation how to, to uh, to, to get our eigenstates. Now we want to know what is the optimal choice of our delta and uh, mu in terms of these eigenstates. For this, we want to minimize the free energy with respect to the full man uh, the full of the full many body Hamiltonian with respect of the eigenstates of the mean field Hamiltonian. This leads to these self-consistency equations then. So now, now we have uh, our delta in terms of the particle and tall wave functions and also our mu in terms of the particle and tall wave functions. And then putting everything together, we end up with this equation. So these are coupled nonlinear equations. We have here marked the nonlinearities here. Uh, and I'll go into the, uh, how we want to solve them in a second. First, I want to introduce a, another scheme, how to solve the self-consistency problem approximately. So solving these equations is, is not possible analytically. Uh, so in analytical works of the superconductor insulator transition, sometimes there's a reduced self-consistency scheme that is used, and I want to introduce one uh, here. So we use this Hamiltonian, where these T operators are in the basis of H0, so the Anderson Hamiltonian, with the uh, disorder potential of our mean field Hamiltonian. How to get this, just we neglect the hard reshift, we change in this basis, and then we only keep the pairing between the time-reversed states. So in this basis, all of the states would be paired, but we only keep the pairing of the time reverse states. And then it has the form of the BCS Hamiltonian. We can instantly write down the se uh, self consistency equations for that. And the scheme is, for example, used by Feigelmann in his analytical treatment of the superconductor insulator transition. Now, how do we solve our self consistency problem? want to solve it iteratively. We start from an uh, uh, initial guess for delta and mu tilde. Then we determine, uh, determine the new potentials. We update our Hamiltonian while uh, always adjusting our chemical potential so that the particle density is kept fixed. And this we repeat until self-consistency is reached up to some tolerance. So the second step here is problematic if we want to calculate large systems. If we want to do it in the conventional way, conventionally we just fully diagonalize our Hamiltonian but this uh, is no longer feasible for large systems. So what do we do then? We uh, implemented a, uh, a code based on the kernel polynomial method. That means we expand um, some observable in Chebyshev polynomials in our case. Here we do it for the local density of states with which we th can get then the particle density which we, uh, that we need for the Hartree potential. So I skip the details here. Basically we have to calculate the, uh, these kind of matrix elements. Here, this is the whole positional eigenstate, and then we have a Chebyshev polynomial in the middle that is uh, a matrix value, so it's, this is the Hamiltonian again. Um, and th this is, uh, so it, the, the nth Chebyshev polynomial is a polynomial of order n, so we need to do H multiplications of the matrix with the vector V. Um, and through the recursion relation, of the Chebyshev polynomials, we can calculate the next moment from the previous no moment. So in total, we only need the number of moment uh, matrix vector multiplications. And as our matrix is very sparse, this works very efficiently. So with respect to full diagonalization, we reduce the complexity of our problem from n to the 
three uh, uh, lattice sites to n to the two lattice sites. Uh, and this, uh, through this, we were able to to also increase the the system sizes that we can calculate by a factor of five with respect to um, the the closest um, in the literature that has been done before. So there's another very important optimization that you might be interested in. This works for all very sparse matrices. So sparse matrix vector multiplication is a memory bound operation. That means um, the performance is is limited by how much um, how much uh, data we can get in our registers. Um, so we want to avoid re uh, loading redundant information. And if we look at our matrix here, we have a lot of redundant information. So all the hoppings are the same. And also this delta for the particle and the whole state is the same in the at the first site and the on-site energies. So we can only load this once, only this once, and this we only need to load once for the whole matrix. So actually we only need one th sixth of the, the load operations. And we have implemented this and our code is works more than twice as fast as based uh, for, with this matrix free approach um, <coughs> compared to to conventional sparse matrix methods um, now I want to go into our results but first uh, so I talk about the superconduct insulator transition but actually in mean field this transition doesn't happen in our case because we don't have phase fluctuations I told you in the bosonic scenario uh, we lose global phase coherence but in mean field, this never happens. We always have a global phase coherence, but still we can see signatures of this transition. We see that this, uh, the the uh, here here are some calculations by Trivedi. Um, we see here the mean field uh, phase stiffness. It also goes down by an order of magnitude. This V here is our W, so that is order strength. Where if you include phase fluctuations, it actually goes to zero. But we can already see on mean field signatures of this transition. Yes. Now going into the results here, this is the average gap with the action strength here on the x-axis and uh, this order strength on the y-axis. Um, we want to move now from from with for fixed interaction strength up in this order strength and see what happens to uh, the pairing amplitude. Our particle density is kept fixed at 0 0.875. And all calculations were uh, performed at t equals zero. So, for low disorder strength, uh, we want to compare here the fully self-consistent scheme with the energy-only scheme that I, uh, this reduced self-consistency. And here we have an additional intermediate thing where we basically used the energy-only scheme but included the Hartree potential as calculated in the fully self-consistent scheme uh, in the energy-only scheme as an external potential. So for low uh, disorder strength, we see already some inhomogeneities uh, developing, but the pairing amplitude is zero nowhere, so th you cannot see this here, I don't know why, but this is in units of the uh, BCS value of the gap. So at zero, we are ex exactly at the BCS value, so whether we have translational invariance. Um, we see it's here increased somewhere and reduced somewhere, but it doesn't go to zero anywhere or close to zero. And uh, what, what we can already see from the comparison of the schemes is that in the fully self-consistent scheme, uh, the variance is highest, whereas in this intermediate scheme, it's, uh, it's already reduced, and in, the, in this pure energy-only scheme, it's uh, in, uh, reduced the most. So if we increase now our this order strength, here we start see that islands start to develop. So we really start to see an insulating sea developing around uh, areas where the um, pairing amplitude is actually increased with respect to the PCS value. Um, now, if we l when we look at this intermediate scheme, we see something similar, but again, way less pronounced. There are orders of magnitude between here and there, even though we see similar structures developing. In the energy-only scheme, without the hard shift, we see none of this. this no, no structures on, on, on the um, length scale of the coherence length. So, so this is on the length scale of the coherence length are visible. This basically looks only like, like noise. And if we increase our solder strength even further, that gets even more pronounced. 
So we can already see from one disorder configuration that this is between uh, the energy only scheme and the fully self consistent scheme. Um, and especially for observables like the phase stiffness, this will make a, a huge difference, a difference because um, yeah, this, this we, we these superconducting islands that can barely talk to each other anymore for the phase stiffness to go down significantly. Now, uh, I, I, sh I showed you this uh, for, so for a typical sample, but we can al also see this in this order average quantities, so we want to look at the autocorrelation function now of the pairing amplitude. We look at it in momentum space. This is numerically more convenient, so just delta Q squared. Uh, this is how it looks for two disorder configurations, uh, for, for, for two disorder strengths, sorry. This is disorder average now. So this is for low disorder, this is for high disorder. We see a peak here at pi pi. This is from the Fermi surface still, this we are not interested in. We're interested at this peak at zero, uh, which gets more and more pronounced as we increase um, W, and we're in interested in the curvature of this, um, this peak, which will be our correlation length. So to extract that, we go along the QX direction here and compute the curvature. And this we have done here. So uh, this is now for the fully self-consistent scheme. We see that for, for low disorder strength, this is the blue uh, curve. We have a high curvature, me meaning a, a high uh, correlation length. And then for green interaction strength, which is a, a high uh, disorder strength, uh, for, for the green curve, which is a high uh, disorder strength, we see we have a, l a higher curvature than for the intermediate disorder strength here. So we have here a local maximum in the um, in the correlation length. And this uh, is roughly at the value that uh, we uh, we saw from uh, before, where when we include fluctuations, the phase stiffness goes to zero. So we think this is a signature of the uh, of this island development uh, and the signature of the superconductor insulator transition that we get this local maximum in the correlation length here. Now comparing this to the um, s reduced self-consistency schemes. So to the right here, this we have the scheme with the Hartree shift. Here's energy only. We see they don't have any appreciable curvature, which means the correlation length is roughly zero. So we, we cannot see this effect at all. Also on the level of um, disorder average quantities, we miss uh, signatures of the superconductor insulator transition. So, in conclusion, uh, full self-consistency is important for the island development, which is a hallmark of the superconductor insulator transition in the bosonic scenario, which is already evident from a single impurity configuration. And um, also this non-monotonic behavior, which we attribute to the, uh, to the superconductor insulator transition, is only represented in the fully self-consistent scheme. Now, what uh, will be interesting to see is what are the consequences now for analytical theories of the superconductor insulator transition that make use of this energy only scheme this we uh, haven't uh, uh, haven't calculated yet but we will do it in the future also i had talked about this briefly in the beginning with the um, self consistent field ensembles this we also have not computed what does it the self consistency con condition imply for the uh, level spacing distribution for example and finally, uh, Igor talked about this in, in his talk about the mesoscopic fluctuations. It will be interesting to compare our, um, our self-consistent results to the field theoretical results that, that Igor has, for example, for the Elders fluctuations. And with that, I thank you for your attention. No, uh, the thing